You're listening to the Small Business Talk podcast with Kathy Smith. Welcome to Small Business Talk, episode 142. Today, my guest is Scott Traverthan, and Scott is from financialfanatics.com. So welcome, Scott. Thank you, Kathy. It's a great pleasure to be here. Fabulous. And today's topic is how to unfunk your business finances. So do tell, how can we unfunk your business finances? Um, well, a few different ways, Kathy. And I think it really, from a small business owner's perspective, it really comes down to, um, first of all, understanding that you, your business numbers might be in a funk. And, you know, if I look at the definition of that word funk, it just sort of means something's not right. Something is, you're, you're avoiding something. Uh, it's not attuned to the way that could ultimately be serving you. So to unfunk something is really to fix it so that it's actually serving you. So another way to say that would be, how do you make, how does a small business owner make sure that they can um, get their financial situation or their financial management really into a situation that it's actually serving them rather than sort of detracting from what the magic is that they bring into the world. So that's why, that's what, that's what drives me. I'm very passionate about, I'm an accountant um, and I'm very passionate about uh, helping small business overcome that thing that everyone's got this natural aversion to. It's like, oh, bookkeeping, accounting stuff. I don't want to know about it. Um, but, but so I wrote a book called Unfunky Business Finances to really help those small business owners just very quickly and easily understand uh, what it is that they need to do in order to unfunk their business finances. Fantastic. So can we just wind that back a little bit? Oh, and absolutely. as you know, we, we're not really good at numbers and we, we don't like bookkeeping and accounting. So We, we do, we do. That. We've got to change that mindset. We love ah, it. Ah, very good, yeah. very good. So don't switch off, guys. Don't switch off. And more profit. <laughs> absolutely. So that was going to be my question. Can you tell us what numbers we should be looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So um, what I talk about is really the key drivers of your business. So what it is that's going to have the biggest impact on you. Now, in order to understand that, in order to, you've got to sort of enter the world of the matrix and you've really got to understand what accountants talk. You know, it's a different language and I completely acknowledge that. It was really hard for me to write a book that wasn't just, you know, a boring old accounting textbook. So it was really about trying to help the business owner decipher what the accountants are actually trying to say. So things like understanding what your balance sheet is all about and how, how to actually read that, understanding what your profit and loss is. So what's revenue, what's contribution margin, what's gross margin, all of those sort of things. What are your fixed overhead expenses? What are they all about? And what is ultimately a profit? And then finally, your cash flow. What you know? What's happening with your cash flow? Why is it that you can make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars profit and only have twenty thousand dollars in the bank at the end of the year? Where did all the rest of that money go? So, those three financial statements, understanding what the accountants are talking about, and understanding those three financial statements, to me, is a little pivotal, pivotal for a small, medium-sized business owner to really start really unfunking themselves so that they can. Find the levers that really make a big impact on their business. What's going wrong? Do less of that. What's going right? Do more of that. So in order to do that, we need to measure stuff because, you, as you know, what gets measured gets managed. Absolutely. And that is so true. So if we're looking at something like a P&L, a profit and loss, what are those two figures actually? What is the profit made up of and what is the loss? Sure. Okay. So generally speaking, uh, profit is all of your sales, all of the all of the money that you get from selling things, uh, less the cost of uh, buying those things in order to sell them. If you're doing services, you might not have any of those additional costs. We call them costs of goods sold, uh, and that gets you equals your gross profit. Uh, and then you take all of the overheads, all of the other things that you needed to just run your business in general. It might include rent and might include subscriptions, probably does if you're anything like me, lots and lots of subscriptions. Um, and, then, and then at the end of the day, all of the money in that you've earned in, less all of the money that you've spent out for a given period of time will either be a positive number or a negative number. If it's a positive number, that's a profit. If it's a negative number, then sadly, that's a loss. And it's just for that period. So there's, the numbers don't say anything about you as a person. They're not subjective. They're just 
objective numbers. So uh, you mustn't feel bad about them. They are telling you something that you would should find absolutely amazing and riveting. So if you look deep enough into those numbers, where can I cut expenses out? Where can I increase my revenues? What products or services make me the most profit? So they're the, they're the key things as a business owner you would want to know, right? And it might be a case if you've given people too longer terms and they're taking too long to pay. So you've actually done the service and they've literally bought it and, or paid for it, but the money hasn't come in. So it might be a case of looking at those payment terms and going, well, if you're going to take three months to pay, maybe I need to get a deposit. Maybe I need to get some instalments along the way, or maybe you just need to pay up front. That's, that's a really great point, Kathy. Often we don't find that reflected in the profit and loss. So we definitely find that reflected in the balance sheet, um, depending upon whether we're, you know, again, I don't want to get too technical because, you know, we can account on the profit and loss on a cash basis, which means when you actually receive the income from the things that you sold or an accruals basis, which means whatever you sold, whether they paid for it or not. Um, so you generally when accountants talk to you, they'll talk to you in accruals terminology. So it's when you've actually made the sale, whether they've paid for it or not. And the same with your supplies, whether you've actually paid for the supplies or not, it's irrelevant. All of that information is going to be sitting on your balance sheet. And also, very importantly, as you pointed out, on your cash flow statement. So the cash flow statement is the catalyst between the two, not the catalyst, rather, it's the result of the two. Um, where, you know, because they, those have, people haven't paid you early enough, even though you've made a really good profit, it's all sitting on your balance sheet in receivables. And that's a problem because your cash flow is now not enough or you want to get that cash yourself. And then you can take, as you said, then you can take action. And that's what, that's what it's all about, identifying where the problems are and then taking action to fix that. Okay, so we've done a little bit of a, a crash course on bookkeeping or accounting, or we've gone and spoken to our people and we're understanding all the different terminology. So what numbers should we be now looking at? So we're getting out our three reports yep. and we're, we're obviously looking at our bank account quite um, extensively. What should we be looking at as a small business? And that's a great point. I mean, bank account is one of the key things to look at. And it's often one that business owners will look at, look at instinctively because they don't want to run out of money, right? You, especially if you employ people, you want to make sure you've got enough money to pay your people because that's going to be really embarrassing turning up to work that next day if you didn't have enough money in your bank account to pay your employees um, and pay your suppliers as well. Tax office is probably a little bit less out of the direct scope of business owners, uh, but you will need to pay them obviously on time as well. So that, those things are really important. Um, the liability side of things, what we, what we look at from a ratio perspective, and I don't want to scare people with talk of ratios, I talk about it a, a little bit in the book, but it's the current ratio. So it's your current assets uh, um, divided by your current liabilities. And what we're looking for there is at least one. So at least your current assets, which include things like your bank account, people who owe you money, uh, inventory, if you've got inventory or stock uh, is another word for inventory, those three things, because they're things that are either are cash or easy to turn into cash. And then we compare that to the current liabilities and current liabilities are just number, you know, amounts that we have to pay in the next 12 months. So things like superannuation liabilities or GST, BAS, that sort of stuff, um, your trade suppliers will make up a big portion of those as well. Um, so as long as our current assets are equaling our current liabilities, there's not going to be much problem. If there's not, then it kind of just means that we've got to try and dip into our long-term assets or we need to might maybe borrow some money. So that's it's really important to look at that current ratio on the balance sheet. From a profit and loss perspective, I think the biggest number is the contribution margin or the gross margin of the business. And that's just simply the sales that the business makes less the direct costs of making that sale. So um, if you are selling glasses, say, um, wearing glasses at the moment. Uh, so if you're selling glasses, then, um, and you have to buy those glasses off someone else, a glasses supplier, you might be selling them for $100 and you're buying them from the glasses supplier for $20. Well, then the contribution on selling a pair of glasses is $80. So that's really important to understand. And it's important to understand that on each product, because often small businesses, when you have a look at the inventory, the things that they're actually selling, 
Um, some things they're making a really good margin on, it might be 50% or 70% or 80% or more. And some things they're not making a very good margin at all. And they think that those things are important, but they're not really making much money off them. So it's really important to know your contribution margin or your, or your gross margin in general, your gross profit, if you like, because then you can match your profit uh, and your overheads to that gross margin, because that's all the money that you've got to spend. Um, I don't want to go too deep down the minefield here, Kathy, with that. <laughs> and I guess the other thing when you are looking at those margins is to have a, a slightly bigger picture as well and see what those products actually are, because sometimes those minor ones might be the entry level into your business. So it might be something that they're basically having a little bit of a taste or it might be, say, if you were selling pet supplies, it might be the leads that are, as in a dog lead or a cat lead or that kind of lead, um, that are not got a high margin on it. But once they come in for that, then they need a harness, then they need dog food, then they need a whole pile of other things. So just be aware of not only your margins, but what else is in that ecosystem. I couldn't agree more. And this is where if you're armed, you know, for forewarned is forearmed, right? So if you are armed with the knowledge that you've got something called a loss leader, um, or it's really like a marketing expense, right? So you don't care about how much margin you're making on something because it brings more customers and you'll ultimately make more sales by selling that for a very low margin. Um, understand that that's what you're doing. So make sure that you do understand that. And then you can explain it to your accountant when they ask um, or, or some sort of internal accountant, someone who's giving you advice can say, well, why are you selling these cat leads when you don't make any money out of them? Well, that's because they're actually really a marketing cost more than anything else. Because yeah, we don't make any money out of them, but you know, our, our total cost per, sorry, our total sales per customer is so much higher because we've got that item. But it's a really good point you make, Kathy. Yeah, and I think sometimes people don't realise that. They just go, well, this one makes me 50% profit, so I'll sell more or of those, and this one doesn't make me any profit, so I'll cut that, and then suddenly you're not making any profit at all because that was your loss leader that was bringing your customers in. Yeah, I mean, and, and when you do an analysis based on each item, and I think that's what is really important to deep dive. So, okay, I'm not earning enough margin, or my margin from last year is slipping. So I used to, I made about... 30% gross profit last year. This year, I'm only making about 27%. So what's gone wrong? Then you can delve into the items that are making up that gross margin and say, oh, okay, I have been focusing a lot on this product, but not on this one anymore. And, and often, I think as businesses, we're guilty of this. Don't worry about the accounting or the, or the financial area. We're guilty about this no matter what it is. We stopped doing something that was working just because we weren't necessarily understanding that it was working. Um, and then we sort of look back and go, why did we stop doing that? It really worked for us. Uh, and then we can start doing it again. But we can only do that if we're aware of what it was in the first place, right? Yes. And sometimes we stop doing it because we see the next shiny object and go, oh, I'll have a go at that one. And then you definitely, forget. Definitely, definitely. I mean, who isn't guilty of that? Absolutely. <laughs> Agree 100%. You forget that they, you should have been continuing on with the thing that was working. Yes, 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 yes. Test and adjust. That's what I always say. You know, if you can, if there's something new that comes along, there's no reason that you shouldn't be testing it and maybe adjusting it. If it beats what you were doing, then that's great. If it wasn't, then uh, stop doing it. And then we've heard from a marketing perspective, you know, there's always AB split testing, all that sort of stuff. Well, you can actually do that from a financial perspective as well. So, uh, you know, this I'm going to try this supplier or I'm going to try something else. If it does work, that's great. If it doesn't work, well, then you can go back to the original thing that you were doing. But as long as you understand what it was that you were doing and why you made certain decisions, then you can always go back to what was working if, it, if the new thing's not working. Yes, and especially with suppliers, if you're putting through a lot of stock, so whether it be a, um, an inventory style thing or whether it's just a quantity, you can always go to them and try and negotiate a better rate too because a lot of suppliers will actually give you a much better rate if you're doing volume. And it's strange, isn't it, that we, the world that we live in at the moment often um, punishes loyalty. So we certainly see that in the banks and financial institutions, but um, if you don't ask, if you don't say, look, I've been a great customer for five years, then they're going to give you the highest rate, not the lowest. Um, it's probably the same with your suppliers too. It's like, yeah, you're a great customer. We love you. You pay on time. It's great. So we're going to give you the highest 
price possible because you know we, you're really valuable to our business. Where if you said, look, I don't want to go somewhere else. I'd rather stay with you because you know I have been a loyal customer. But how about giving me a little bit of a break here on uh, the prices that we charge? But but what I contend is it's all right to do all of that sort of stuff, but you really need to measure it. Uh, and you really need to know what it is that you're trying to achieve when you're achieving that as well. Because as accountants, we always say, look, you know what? You need to minimize your costs. You need to minimize your costs. In reality, that doesn't work. So something's going on in, in business, minor, business owners' heads that says, no, I don't want to decrease my costs. I want to maximize my sales. So I don't really care about that side of things. I'm all about selling, not, not saving money. So I want to make money. I don't want to save money. Um, so we have a sort of a mental block about doing that. But if we knew that, oh, okay, our overheads are a little, or our, or our margins a little bit low, what can we do about that? Oh, maybe going to see our supplier and getting a better price, getting a bit of a bit of bigger discount, that would help. So that would help it bring our margins back up to where they were. So therefore we can justify the shiny bright things that we bought in the overheads, like a new car or something else, or, or that fancy holiday, if we ever have holidays again. <laughs> so there's two points that you mentioned there. So one about the suppliers thinking that they're going to give us the highest price. I think a lot of the times they just don't think about us. They just go, well, you're an absolute fantastic client. You pay on time. Terrific. You're, you're not a problem. So we'll just keep doing what we're doing. And they don't actually think about, oh, maybe I'll offer a Scott that new rate that I've offered somebody else because he's so good. And the other thing there is sometimes we get what we pay for. So if you push your loyal suppliers down too far, then you're no longer their best client. So therefore, they will not often give you that same service. So sometimes paying a little bit more actually gets you a better service. So it needs to be a win for you and a win for them as well. Absolutely. And that's why I would I would really, because I've seen this in, in business, lots of different businesses um, where the business owner has gone out and just not made friends with their suppliers at all. Just, just gone and said, I want a discount. I want a discount. I want a discount. I need it. I need it. I need it. And they're like, okay. They might give you a discount, but as you said, you're going to go to the bottom of the queue when it goes to delivery. You're going to go, you're just not going to get all the extra things. And, and really, um, they would rather not deal with you if they didn't have to. So I, I think there's being nice does pay off in this world. Um, being fair definitely does pay off in this world. Um, but yeah, but don't let people take advantage of you either. But if you know what you're trying to achieve in the first place, rather than just going out there and saying, I need to cut all my costs by 10%, then at least you're going to have a better opportunity of doing that. Yes, and so much so, um, particularly in the last few years, we're seeing that business is all about relationships. So that's not only relationships with your customers, it's relationships with your stakeholders and relationships with your suppliers. So very valid point. Absolutely. And, and you only know some of those stakeholders, you only know that the relationship wasn't where you thought it was when you go and actually do something. So if you go and actually ask for more money from a bank, if they were lending you or, or an investor, you're thinking of an opportunity. And all of a sudden, if you haven't really banked along the way, all of the goodwill points, uh, then often they can turn around and say no. And, and then you won't be able to do what you want to do and spread the magic that you spread as a business owner in the world. Yes, and I think that's very true that sometimes you don't deal with these people apart from the transactions for years and years and years. And then you go, well, why didn't they look after me? Well, basically, you're just a number on that spreadsheet. They didn't really know you at all. So yeah. it's definitely relationships that you need to build. Okay, yeah. so we're, we're looking at some numbers. We're starting to track things. So we, we know if we're making any profit or loss. We've looked at the loss leaders. What else should we be looking at in our business? Well, I, I think one of the things that I focus on with Unfunky Business Finances is also the relationship that you have with your, your accounting team. So that could include um, a chief financial officer. That could be a part-time virtual person or it could be a financial controller, depending upon the size of your business. Um, it could be... Uh, your internal accounting team, and that might be bookkeepers if they're external, or it might be an internal uh, resource that you have working for you as well, um, and your external accountant as well. And one of the things I, I want uh, business owners to understand, I'm not anti-accountant in any way, shape or form. Uh, I don't have an accounting firm, so there's no... Um, no interest there for me. But I really think that there's most accountants that I've ever met really, really, really want to help their small business clients, but their small business clients don't let them. And it's not because 
they don't want them to. It's just because they're doing some things that really detract from the relationship rather than enhance it. And the whole holy grail here that we've been talking about in the accounting industry for many, many years is proactive advice. And that is your accountant actually ringing you not to ask you to pay money or not to give you bad news about a tax bill that's due, but actually to give you advice that's pertinent to your business that's going to make you money. So I titled that chapter, How to, make your, How to Let Your Accountant Make You Rich. And I think that's what I think businesses need to be focused on, how you can help your accountant help you. Yes, and that is a, a very valid point because sometimes we only see them once a year, our accountants, and when we do, we sort of don't really want to tell them everything that's going on, whereas if we open up a little bit more and they're going to see our numbers anyway, and it's not about being a, a bad person or a good person, but sometimes it might be a structure. So you, you've got bigger now, now you've got employees, so the st business structure you started with might not be working for you. So talking to your accountant about that might work better. It might be a case of a, a tax management thing and your current structure doesn't work. So there's all these things that you don't know, generally, unless you're in that industry and we don't know what we don't know. So being a bit more open and discussing some plans with your accountant, like you say, can quite often make you rich. It's, it's look, and it's definitely a mindset thing. You've got to stop thinking of your accountant. This is your external accountant. You've got to stop thinking them as a, a cost. You've got to start thinking of them as someone who can make you more money. Um, and they really, really, a good accountant will be worth their weight in gold. They, they will absolutely give you the right advice at the right time and save you a whole bunch of tax, but also help you really make more money. So it's just changing your mindset if you've got an accountant that just wants to see you once a year and you won't and, and just want us to do your annual tax and take six months or eight months to do that, then maybe it's time to change accountants but um, and get someone who will and start off on the right foot, definitely. Yes, and I think it is, once again, like we've been talking about relationships. So if you're not getting that relationship with your accountant, you may have inherited the accountant through family or business or whatever and you don't have that rapport with the accountant, then maybe look at somebody else and vice versa. If your accountant's not giving you the information you need, once again, you might need to, to look at somebody else. But if you're not providing them with that information that they need, then they can't do their job. Exactly right. I, and I, I was, I'm advocating that, that go to your accountant. Don't necessarily write them off or, or, or go to the next shiny accountant because the same thing, you'll, you'll be in the same situation in two years' time, I promise. Go to your accountant and say, well, this is what my expect my expectations have changed and this is what I want to do. And I want to work closer with you and I want to do this and I want to do that and I want to, I want to listen to you. I want you to give me advice. I'm, I'm here for you. I want to listen and I want to learn. Um, and you'd be amazed at what accountants will give to you. And they won't, they might charge a little bit more, but often they won't because they'll just say, okay, you want to learn? I'll, I've got some whole bunch of things that I can teach you. If you can show that you're willing to give them value, uh, to value what the advice is that they've, they're giving to you, then you'll be amazed that the, the, the amount of advice that comes to you will be immense and, and immensely valuable as well. And yes, and remember once again what you're actually paying for. If you're paying a, a cheap person in the, the supermarket, outside the supermarket that's got to pop up and doing your tax, it's probably not where you need to go to grow your business. But on the, the converse side, you don't necessarily need the the one in the CBD with all the flash buildings as well. So just make sure that you do a little bit of homework. And if you do have an existing account, you at least speak to them before you run away. Absolutely, Kathy. Absolutely. And accountants, you can actually move. It's a very big myth out there that once you've got one, you can't move. You can actually move and you can I have know things about me and it'll be really hard and a new guy won't know anything and it'll cost a lot of money. Yeah, none of that's really true. Um, there's people, clients move accountants all the time. And so they're professional associations. That's the Chartered Accountants of Australia and New Zealand or the CPAs of Australia. They all have, and the Institute of National Accountants as well, um, they all have very set processes for that accountants have to follow when there's a new accountant that's been appointed. So don't think that you can't move. Yes, you absolutely can. And unless you haven't paid the bill, they're going to be, um, they're going to be able to facilitate any change anyway. So uh, I wouldn't necessarily advocate 
advocate for you to change in that first instance. But uh, if you really feel like you're just not going to get anywhere, then absolutely find someone that's more suitable to you. And that could be like someone who specializes in your industry, or it could be someone that specializes in uh, your location or um, someone that's been referred to you that in, in a similar business. So there's lots of different ways that you can choose an accountant for sure. Yes. And for our um, overseas listeners, our American and Canadian listeners, of course, you guys would also have um, associations and rules that the accountants have to um, follow there too. Good point, Cathy. CPA in Australia is different to CPA in the US, but you, exactly the same, exactly the same, um, uh, you know, ethical requirements that they would have to change accounts for sure. Yes, and I think the other thing that you need to realise too is that geographical location is not a restriction anymore. Um, years and years ago, I moved from one side of Australia to the other, and I had to change my accountant because I could no longer go and see the one that was in my original hometown. But now, of course, that wouldn't be an issue because with all the, the document signing and things that are available, and including Zoom, um, you're actually able to do that. So even if you are moving areas, don't necessarily write off the accountant you've had if they've been doing a really good service for you. 100% agree. I used to say to people, you know, I think it's good to have an accountant that you can actually go and walk and talk and have a coffee with and, and get that sort of some nonverbal cues. Um, I guess we're all getting pretty good at Zoom nowadays. So um, there, there's less of that requirement to do that. Um, to, in order to get the really good information from them. I'm, I'm still probably trending, because I'm a little older maybe, I'm trending towards you know, a local accountant or someone that you can actually go and have lunch with would be better than not. But um, yeah, absolutely. We've got the technology. It doesn't matter where you are. At least that's the, that's the case for Australia. I think in the US and other jurisdictions, it might be a little bit more difficult to different state licensing and things like that. But definitely throughout Australia, there's no difference for sure. Perfect. Okay, so we've talked about some numbers. We've talked about some accounting style ideas, which was um, a, a bit different to where I thought this was going to go, but that's perfectly okay. So what do you think is a, a wrap up small business really need to be looking at when they're thinking about finances and their numbers? I just need to work out what's actually going to work for them. Um, profit first is really the, the buzz at the moment, all the rage. And what Mike Michalowicz has done with Profit First is really take some, taken some pretty basic concepts and turned them into something that you can actually do. And I think Scott Pape, the Barefoot Investor, did the same thing for personal finances. So for me, a small business owner really can, there's things that they can do to help manage their finances, to um, help them understand exactly what, what it is that they need to be looking at and, and, and make more money, essentially make, keep more cash. So it's all about that organisation of your financial, uh, of, it, of your management of your financials that means that you can spend less time on it, worry about it less and focus more on, you know, what your actual business does and how you actually spread joy and value to the world. So it's all about that organisation piece for mine. Yes. But and also, it... Cathy, if I can just add the... You know, I always encourage, and again, the final chapter of the book is all around um, the end game. So what is it that you're trying to achieve at the end of the day with your business? Um, so from a financial perspective, all, all too often as an accountant, you, we saw businesses who want to get sold come to the accountant and say, okay, can now can you make it look good? And those business owners will have to at least spend three years doing things a little bit differently in order to dress their business up so that it's saleable. And I would say you're better off operating like that right now, but have a look. I'm going to sell this business in five years or I'm going to give it to my kids or whatever I'm going to do. Have an understanding of what you're trying to achieve now. And then it's so much easier to achieve that goal uh, when you want to do it, whether it's five years, 10 years. You can always change your mind, but at least if you've got a clear direction to head, uh, head in, then I think you're so much better off. Absolutely. And unpacking a couple of things you said there, I'm definitely a, a fan of Profit First and um, Mike Michalowicz and Mike Motorbike, as he calls himself. And yeah, <laughs> if you aren't tracking your numbers in any way, shape or form, you've really got no idea. So making sure that you are actually looking at what you're doing 
and that way you can make informed decisions. And to comment on your, your last point there, it really does depend on what you want to do with your business. So definitely having that degree of um, accountability. Um, we've had a, a lot of problems here in Australia where people have geared their businesses so that they don't pay a lot of tax and then they've gone to try and borrow money for a home for instance and the banks have gone or their lending institutions have gone well you're not actually earning anything because their businesses are set up so they don't pay tax so they don't actually earn anything but then they don't have an income in the flip side when you're looking at borrowing money so just remember what it is like Scott said for the end game of where you want your business to go, whether you are selling, whether you're minimising tax, whether you're looking at borrowing against it, whether you're looking at expanding, whether you've got employees, all of those sort of things. So definitely conversations with a really good accountant is the way to go. Totally agree, totally agree. Okay, so if people would like to know more about you and more about how to unfunk your business, how can they find you, Scott? Uh, they can find me on the website, uh, themodernaccountant.com. Uh, also, if they would like, uh, anyone who's listening would like a copy of the book, very happy to send one out to them. Um, the your address there is unfunkbook.com forward slash home. Fantastic. And we'll put those in the show notes. Now, at this point in the podcast, I get to ask you five questions. Are you game, sure. Scott? I'm always game. Always game, Kathy. <laughs> Excellent. What is the best advice given to you by a mentor? Um, keep going. So uh, you can quit any time, but so why quit now? I like that. I've just been reading the, um, oh, what's it called? It's called Extreme Ownership. Um, oh, yeah. And it's written by two Navy SEALs and they explain what the ringing of the bell actually means. And yes, it's all about not quitting. You can quit anytime. You just need to go and ring the bell three times, but yep. then you're out and you're done. So yep. like that. Hang in there. Doesn't always ups and downs, but if you if you're not in the game, you're not in the game, right? Exactly. What is the biggest help you have received since starting your business? Um really. Uh, business education in general, I think, has been massively helpful to me. Um, there's been tons and tons of aha moments that I've had through that, whether it's dealing with an area that I'm not very good at, marketing and sales or, or other bits and pieces. So um, I, I'd have to credit Dale Beaumont with uh, starting me off on my business education journey, um, gone on to Tony Robbins and a bunch of other stuff. But, but uh, certainly Dale Beaumont from Business Blueprints kicked all that off. So I'd say that's where that started. Fantastic. What is the one thing you have to do every day? You're non-negotiable. I get it. I guess the, the real non-negotiable for me every day is do some sort of physical exercise. Um, it's got I've got to do that. I've got to get my mind going. So I, I would I would love to have said meditation, but you know, kind of that can sometimes drop off. I'm, I'm at least five days a week meditating, but um, you know, sometimes on the weekend that slips. But I'll still need to do some exercise each and every day to try and uh, you know, energize and refresh me. Fabulous. And I think for some people, exercise can be meditation. So sometimes you can combine the two. Well, I like to think that, but sometimes it doesn't work. But yeah. <laughs> what is your favourite business book and why? Favourite business book? Um, you know what? I'm going to go back to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, go all the way back to, to that because it was the book for me. It was the book that started off me, my understanding that there's a difference between an employee and a business owner and, you know, how to, you know, you don't have to go down the path of the business owner. You can go and be an investor or you can just stay an employee. Uh, but I certainly wanted to be, back when I read that, I wanted to be uh, the best uh, employee ever. I just wanted to be a, a super financial controller working for a great business and really adding value and really uh, doing everything I needed to do as an employee. Uh, and then when I read that book, I thought, actually, maybe I don't want to be an employee anymore. So um, there goes my journey. But yeah, I Rich Dad Poor Dad was probably the best book. I've. Excellent. And what do you wish you had known when you started out? <laughs> 
Um, I, re I really wish I would known that it wasn't going to be something, there wasn't any easy answers. So, and some things were going to come easy, uh, but a lot of things were going to take a long time and, and really be a hard slog. So um, I guess the thing that I, I really would have, I should have known was that the journey was going to be a lot harder and longer than I ever thought it would be. There's no, it takes, it takes a long, long time, many, many years to become an overnight success, right? It does. What do they say? An overnight success, 10 years in the making. Exactly. <laughs> I can certainly attest to that. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much for your wisdom, Scott, and your time. And we appreciate you being on Small Business Talk. My absolute pleasure, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Don't forget to subscribe to Small Business Talk podcast and head on over to smallbusinesstalk.com.au forward slash downloads for all the show notes and links to this episode. Remember, to be great, you must start. Pick one tip from today's episode, take action and implement it. Let's meet again next week at the same time and place. Until then, take action. And SBT community, enjoy your journey.